thank you for coming, everybody. This next talk is from Doug Hellman, who probably needs no introduction. Uh, this is titled Better Documentation Through Automation, Creating Sphinx Extensions. Please give Doug a warm round of applause. Thank you, and thank you all for coming out today. Uh, many of you are, I'm sure, familiar with the documentation tool Sphinx and uh, probably the DocuTils library on which it's built. Uh, today I'm going to talk about some advanced uses for those tools and ways to extend them to make it uh, easier for you to create your documentation. Uh, I want to start by talking a little bit about restructured text, uh, a little bit of uh, background material. Um, restructured text is a plain text input format uh, defined as part of the DocuTils project that was started by David Goodger back in the day. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with other markup languages, such as Markdown series, um, the seemingly endless flavors of different wiki syntaxes. Uh, but the message I want you to take away from this talk today is that restructured text has one important difference when compared to those other languages, and that is that it is designed from the very beginning to be extensible. Uh, it is super easy to extend the parser to add new features without actually changing the syntax of the markup uh, and confusing your users. And that flexibility and power is the primary reason that I prefer to use restructured text for my documentation uh, over the simpler markups like Markdown or something like that. To understand the full power of restructured text, it's important to understand the different parts of the Sphinx and DocuTils uh, ecosystem and how they process your documents. Uh, the application layer in Sphinx uh, interacts with the user, does all the command line argument stuff, um, and it drives the over, overall job. Uh, the build environment uh, manages the parser and uh, caches computed values like your parse trees and things like that, and it figures out which source files have cha changed and need to be updated each time you uh, run a build for your docs. Uh, the DocuTils parser itself knows the restructured text syntax, obviously, and it creates the parse tree uh, as a representation of the document in memory. Um, and then the Sphinx builder knows how to take that parse tree and turn it into the desired output format that you have. Um, the most common ways to extend the tool chain are to modify the output of the parser or to create a new uh, builder that produces a different output format. Uh, both of those methods work by manipulating the parsed representation of the document, and Sphinx creates a uh, separate parse tree like this for each input file. Um, these uh, doc trees contain nodes for each of the syntactic and structural elements, such as paragraphs and italicized text and tables, and then, of course, the actual text itself. Uh, node types are either defined in DocuTils, or you can create new node types of your own in custom extensions. And I'm going to talk today about two ways to change which nodes appear in the parse tree, uh, and are therefore parsed uh, or processed by the builder to create the output. There are uh, roles and directives. Those are the two basic ways to extend, uh, extend the, the language. Uh, roles are an inline markup tool that can be embedded within a paragraph uh, or some other structural element like a table. Uh, roles have a name and an argument, which is the value between the back ticks. Uh, directives, on the other hand, are a little more complex structural elements. Um, they contain nested restructured text, or uh, such as uh, the see also directive, which you're probably familiar with, uh, or they can refer to external resources like an image tag or something like that to bring in uh, outside pieces and add it to your documentation. So let's look at a few practical situations where you might want to define your own uh, roles or directives. <laughs> This is a snippet of the history file from an older version of a project uh, that I maintain. Um, there are links to four separate bugs explaining what's been fixed in the, the release. And uh, if you notice, one of those links actually points to the wrong URL. So uh, just as in program source code, having to repeat myself to create all of those links individually re resulted not only in ugly source code, but in mistakes. So if we look at the issue links a little more closely, you see that a lot of that text can be eliminated from the source and generated using a custom role. Uh, the title includes the ticket number and some static text, which is repeated every time. The URL for the links is the same for all of the tickets except that last little bit there at the end, which is the ticket ID. And uh, if I take that base URL and I save it to my configuration file, the only information that I really need to provide in the document uh, as an argument to the role is that ticket number. So the link could be re represented with uh, a role like this, uh, which is much easier to read and understand and uh, much uh, less prone to error. 
Um, the code to handle a role in a document like that is called a role processor, and it's implemented it usually in a function. Uh, the inputs are the name of the role that's encountered, uh, the raw text, which is the full source text of the role, uh, the parsed text, which is just the bit inside the back ticks, and the line number of the input document where the role was encountered, and then a bunch of other stuff that gives you state about the inside of the parser that we're not really going to talk about in this example. Um, so I created a BB issue processor um, that's primarily uh, interested in that text argument, so I don't need to worry about any of the other arguments, really. Um, that's going to hold my ticket number, so I'm going to make sure that that looks like a ticket number by turning it into an integer. Um, and then the return value from the role processor is uh, a two-part tuple that contains the list of nodes to add to the document's parse tree and a list of messages to report back to the user in case there were warnings or errors or something like that. In the success case, the node that's a, uh, returned is a link node that's built from the issue number uh, using a convenience function that we'll look at in a minute. And in the error case, the node is created using uh, built-in error reporting functions. So the link node, <coughs> excuse me, is constructed by a uh, separate function that knows how to combine the base URL from my configuration file with a link-specific slug and a link type to build the correct URL. Um, that URL base comes from a global configuration value set in the conf.py, just like all of your other settings. And it's combined with the link type, such as issue and um, the slug. The released version of this extension uh, supports linking to a bunch of different kinds of things, issues, change sets, and users on Bitbucket. Uh, so the links are all being constructed with this helper function, and I pass different arguments from different places. <clears throat> the reference node uh, containing the link uses the link type again with that slug value to build the visible text uh, that will appear in the output document. So for example, the text issue 68 uh, will appear in the URL or will be linked to the URL, rather. Um, to enable the new role, the uh, extension needs to register that role processor with Sphinx and DocuTils. Sphinx looks for and automatically calls a, a setup function as it loads each extension. Uh, so it passes the application context from Sphinx into your setup function, and then as an extension developer, you're expected to use methods on the application context to uh, register your role processors or other uh, features of your extension, um, <clears throat> including, for example, the configuration setting here. Uh, so to add a configuration setting, you specify the name for the option, uh, a default value, and a flag that tells Sphinx uh, what to do when the value of your option changes. And in this case, I have it set so that rebuild, you have to rebuild the whole environment if the base URL uh, changes because I want to make sure all of my links have been updated correctly. So after I enable the extension in my Sphinx project uh, by adding it to the list in the conf.py file, uh, I can rewrite my history file like this. So I've replaced all of those ugly links with uh, instances of the role. And then the bug references are a lot shorter. Um, it's a lot clearer and easier to read. And the rendered output um, always includes consistent uh, and correct links for each of the tickets. All right, roles are good for inline transformations, uh, but to generate a bunch of text or uh, some sort of structural element, you need to use a directive. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, directives are uh, a little more complex. They support different kinds of arguments. Uh, the arguments value that is uh, specified next to the name uh, is frequently used for a title, such as for a figure or, or a table or something like that, but it can also be used as a short form of the directive, like uh, with the image tag. Uh, the <clears throat> Directives also accept options so that you can uh, control how they behave, and there's support for parsing and validating several different common types of options like numbers and booleans, uh, and even list of values, actually. Uh, the body of the directive is used to specify additional content that's fed to the directive to be processed. Um, the syntax for the body is completely left up to the implementer of the directive, so you can pass whatever you want in. Uh, for example, there are directives that take a uh, comma-separated value data and build a table out of that, um, or a note <clears throat> or warning that's uh, styled in some special way or some, uh, you know, with a recursive restructured text parsing. So as an example of what you can do with a directive, I'm going to look at the implementation of the SQL table extension, uh, which is an extension that I created to allow me to embed SQL queries in my source documents and 
get data directly out of the database when the documentation is being built. To build a table, the first thing the directive processor needs to know is how to connect to the database, so I have an option uh, to specify that connection string. Uh, this one is using a local SQLite uh, file, but you can, I'm using SQL Alchemy in the background, so you can use whatever kind of database SQL Alchemy supports. The uh, query is passed as a body of the directive, so restructured text, the docutils parser is not going to uh, look at that except to take the, the actual text and give it to you, so you can, you can specify whatever kind of syntax you want there. Uh, the names of the values returned by the select statement are gonna be used as the column headers, so I've specified some nice column names there to make my table look nice instead of having the database column names. <clears throat> and then instead of a, a single function, processors for directives are implemented with a class, uh, so here I extend the existing table directive since I'm creating a table. Um, that saves a, a fair amount of work. I don't have to re-implement everything. Um, the class attribute option spec tells the base class <clears throat> how to validate the options understood by the directive. Um, so widths here can be a list of integers uh, specifying the relative widths of your columns. The class is used to specify a CSS uh, style name. And the name is used when you want to create a cross-reference in your document that points back to that table. Um, and then the connection string obviously tells me how to connect to the database to get the data. The, uh, the directive processor is instantiated with a bunch of details about the parser state, um, all the line numbers and file names and all of that sort of thing. I don't need to change any of that, so I only defined a run method. Uh, that returns the list of nodes to be added to the document. So uh, unlike with the role processor, I just have to return the nodes, and there are other ways to emit messages um, when you're dealing with directives. So run starts by pulling out the application context from the parser to make it easier to access. You can see that it's nested several objects deep down there. Um, and then the next step is to validate the inputs to the directive. So the main thing that I'm worried about is whether or not I actually have a query uh, because without a query, there's no way that I can build a table. So instead, I generate an error message, and that, that's what I return, and so your document ends up with a big error message in it. Uh, so after verifying that there is a query string, the next step is to connect to the database and execute the query. The connection string uh, either comes from that local option on the directive, or it can actually come from a global configuration setting, which means that if you are getting all of your data from one database, you only have to put that in your config file. You don't have to specify it all throughout your document. <clears throat> now, remember that I said that the body of the directive um, is passed to the directive without any real processing. Well, it comes in as a list of lines, and so the, the next step here is to take that list and join it all back together into one string and give it to SQL Alchemy to execute so that I can get my data back. After the query has been executed, the metadata that I need to format my table is all available in the result object that I get back from SQL Alchemy. Uh, the column heading values come from the query column names. And of course, the contents of the row come from iterating over the result set itself. And the uh, relative widths and the table's uh, title come from the options that were provided by the user. So all that's left at this point is to construct the table node um, and to prepare it to be added to the document structure. Uh, the code for doing that is in a separate helper function, which I'll look at and describe next. Um, after that table node is uh, set up, run needs to return the list containing the table and any messages produced when the title was uh, formatted above. So that's my return value. It's one list of, of results. All right, so let's look at how tables are created. Tables in restructured text are represented with a node structure that looks very familiar to the DOM that you're familiar with with HTML. Uh, a table is a, a node that's a container for other uh, table groups that define sections within the table. Uh, SQL table just uses a single group because it's very s simple and straightforward. You just get one query. Um, the group contains a call spec node that defines the uh, settings for each column. Uh, and it, so that's where I'm going to set the display widths. The group also defines header for the, headers for the columns uh, using a T head node and one or more rows of uh, headers. In the case of SQL table, it's just going to have one row. Uh, each entry in the row <coughs> also is going to um, give your table cell a structure, and then 
uh, within the entry, you have a paragraph node, and the paragraph node is where you actually put the text that you want to display. All right, um, the body of the table is separated from the headers um, in the T body node, and that's so that you can apply separate styles to the head versus the uh, body. The body rows are composed of a set of nodes that look just like your header nodes, except they're in a separate part of your table. All right, so the goal of the SQL table directive is to construct a, a, a tree of these nodes that, based on the data that comes back from the query. And it begins doing that uh, with the outer table structure. So it uh, <clears throat> creates a T group node um, to bundle up the parts of the table. Uh, it creates call spec nodes for each of the columns and sets the column widths on the call spec nodes. And you'll notice here that there's two different ways to extend the tree of nodes. You can either uh, use an addition operator and add in place, or you can call extend and pass it a sequence. Uh, the next step to build is to build the nodes for the table headers. So the T head will contain all of the header rows. And in this case, I've got, as I said, just a single row uh, for the single simple table he header row. Uh, the row gets an entry for each header cell with a paragraph container for the actual text. The processing the table body is very similar, although in this case I chose to use nested loops uh, because it was a little more readable uh, than the generator expressions that I had previously. Uh, each row from the data, uh, from the result set needs a row node. Uh, each column from the results uses an entry node containing a paragraph again. And then after all of the rows are processed, they're added to the body together as a single set. So if we go back to the restructured text source, we can compare it to the way the table output is generated. Uh, the title is there. Uh, the column headings that came from my query are there. And the body rows are sorted by the name column just as the query specified. Roles and directives let you control the content of your document, uh, but the builder lets you change how that content is actually processed. Uh, so to de demonstrate the builder API, I'm going to look at part of the implementation for a spelling checker that I wrote for Sphinx documents. Um, I needed a spelling checker because I use Sphinx for everything from internal documentation to my own website. Uh, and I was finding typos in published things and it, checking all of those files by hand, even with an editor that supported spell checking, was turning into a hassle. So I wanted to automate it. So in order to do that, I knew that I needed to solve four problems. I had to extract the text from the rest of the markup and the input documents. I had to convert that text into a sequence of words. And then I had to figure out some way to look for those words in the dictionary of uh, known good spellings. And I had to come up with a dictionary of known good spellings. And then I also had to figure out what might be meant if I did find a misspelling, so try and come up with suggestions to, to report back. Now, Sphinx and Docutils take care of reading the restructured uh, text source files for me, and Enchant, the spelling checker from Abbey Word, uh, is packaged, it's actually packaged separately as a library, and you, there's a Python API for that. So that handles uh, word detection, uh, words checking, and uh, suggestions as well, and Enchant comes with a dictionary. Um, so that just left two tasks for me to do, which was find the nodes in the parse tree that contain text of one sort or another and ignore the nodes that are probably things like source code that I don't want to run through the spelling checker because they're not going to be valid English words. So to tie all of that into Sphinx, I created a custom build, uh, builder called the Spelling Builder, and it inherits from the Base Builder class. Um, which provides a bunch of useful logic for dealing with uh, input arguments and that sort of thing. Um, the init method here is used to set up the builder, and notice that's not the constructor for the object, that's a separate method that's invoked uh, by the uh, application context at the uh, point when the builder is, when the whole environment is ready to go. <clears throat> the uh, spelling checker class interfaces between spelling builder and PyEnchant, so I pulled that out because it made it a lot easier to test. I didn't have to uh, run all of the, the Sphinx uh, framework in order to test that I had the spelling checker working correctly. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about that. Um, the spelling builder itself uh, records all of the misspelled words in a single text output file, so the last step of the setup here is to open that file up and get it ready to, to have data written to it. Now there's a, a couple of different ways to override the builder API to process the input files. The rate, excuse me, the write method um, is a, sort of a high level where you're given all of the environment and you have to figure out how to process all of the documents yourself. 
Um, the lower level write doc method is called by the default implementation of the write method. Uh, so it, it gets one document at a time, which was exactly what I wanted to deal with. So for the spelling builder, I chose to use the write doc method. Um, it iterates over uh, an in-order traversal of all of the nodes in your parse tree and looks for nodes that might contain text and tries to ignore nodes that are likely to have text that you don't care about having spell checked. Um, and then it gets the text representation of that and passes it to the enchant library through the spelling checker object and the return value here, it's actually a generator that uh, re returns back misspelled words and their suggestions. So if you don't have any, then the loop never executes. And if you do, then you pro you're processing just the data that you care about. <clears throat> Most of the rest of the loop body is dealt, uh, dealing with building uh, messages that, to display on the console using fancy colors and that sort of thing, um, as well as writing them out to that output file. The last piece here sets the exit code for Sphinx uh, so that if I have a misspelled word, it will break my build so that I don't uh, miss that I have a misspelling and I don't push text up to my website or something like that. After all of the parse documents have been processed, uh, the finish method wraps up all of the builder processing by closing the file that contains uh, the misspelled words, the output. And <clears throat> as before, the extension needs to register itself using its setup function, and it does that by passing the builder to the uh, application context. So when Sphinx build is run against normal input files with the new builder, uh, the output shows the document where there was a misspelling, uh, the line number, the word itself, and a set of suggestions for correctly spelled words that look like the one that was misspelled. Um, because the misspelled word causes the builder to set the process exit code to a non-zero value, there's also a message that the documentation uh, fail, or, sorry, the documentation build failed, and so like if you have it in a make file, that'll also exit. All right, that concludes everything that I wanted to talk about today. Uh, I hope you'll do some additional research and look into extending Sphinx yourself, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you might have at this point. I think they want you to use the mic. Can you come back here to the microphone? Sure, that's the question. Thank you. So um, what's your opinion on, rather than learning the, the DocuTales table API, just outputting HTML directly into the document because you're busy and you don't want to learn. Right. Um, that is certainly one option if you only care about producing HTML. Uh, so I used Sphinx to write my book and I needed to generate LaTeX as well. So I needed multiple output formats from the same data, uh, you know, input data. So in your experience, uh, when, I mean, in terms of smaller projects, you know, have you found like a kind of, uh, you know, the line you cross when you should really start considering using some of these more uh, complex tools that Sphinx allow, offers you versus just, you know, manually? Yeah, I mean, that's the sort of thing that's going to come up as you, uh, it'll come up naturally as your project grows. So uh, the project that I've been working on for the past year or so um, has a, a, several tables with long lists of things in them, and we've done all of that by hand right now, but we're looking at automating that at this point because the list has grown to a certain length. And sure. Yeah. That does sound pretty painful. To do yeah. That. Yeah. <laughs> so I wrote a Sphinx extension for my project motor, which um, takes the uh, entire module documentation of one Python project, um, fixes it up a little bit, and then outputs as the documentation for a uh, wrapper project. And I did that by intercepting the doc tree red event. Yes. Um, so I get uh, the tree of nodes, and I look for certain kinds of nodes, and then I edit them as nodes, and then I um, allow the generation process to continue. Um, I found it tremendously difficult to find the nodes I was looking for because they had certain attributes or certain structure of children. Um, so I was in like the same uh, point that you demonstrated, but I was doing something much more complicated than just finding text nodes with a certain Right, parent. yeah, this was a much simpler case than it sounds like what you're describing. 
Is there a more convenient way to um, sort of find kinds of nodes within a complex doc tree? Like an XSLT for doc trees? Uh, yeah, no, there, there is not anything like that that I'm aware of, although I didn't delve very deeply into the DocuTils DOM itself, so there, there may be more convenient search features than what I was using. The, the, the in-order traversal worked for me, so yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a much simpler case than it sounds like what you had. Okay, I think that there might be like a missing feature there for, for a more complicated Yeah, well, it's, it's being actively developed, so if that's something that uh, you find would be useful for you, I'm sure other people would find it useful too and they'd accept a patch upstream. Cool, thanks. Yeah, thanks. What are some of the interesting use cases you found for that SQL connection directive? Um, I got a talk accepted at PyCon. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so as a practical example, it's probably not something you would do a lot with, although you could do something like, uh, you know, if you're building a static website and you have pricing data for something, you might pull that out of a database uh, to generate the website or something like that. Um, but it was a concise example that I could fit into this time slot I was given today. So it was yeah. really cool. Cool, thank you. There are a lot of cool extensions out there. Do you have a standardized way to submit them so that they're you know, available to the general public? That's a great question. I should have covered that. There is a project called Sphinx uh, Contrib which is run by uh, Georg Brandl and a bunch of other people. It's all on uh, Bitbucket, and you can contribute that way, as well as uh, I, several of the extensions that I have, I've, I've put in my own repositories and just posted on PyPy. Thank you. OK. All right. Thanks, everybody. Oh, I just can't talk. Okay, there it is. <laughs>